and uh, she's going to be talking about the scientific basis of climate change, which, of course, is uh, sort of on every, every everyone's mind these days. Yeah, I mean, climate change. I mean, this is one of the most important uh, challenges facing uh, facing us today. Uh, so, uh, well, she'll tell us more about it. And I, I'd like to say a little bit about uh, Dr. Schachberger. She has worked in, uh, she's working on the University of Cambridge, but she's also worked in Paris before and in uh, MIT in, uh, in, in, the, in the States. Uh, and she also frequently goes to the Antarctic on field trips. So I think this is one of the most uh, interesting sort of theoretical at the same time big jobs around. Uh, she is a fellow of the Royal Meteoro Meteorological Society and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts in the UK. And, uh, and I think the most, imp the most interesting fact I learned about her recently uh, is that uh, in 2001, uh, she was selected by an expert panel on the BBC as uh, the smartest uh, woman in the United Kingdom. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a great privilege for all of us here to meet. Uh, you can go back. Uh, some of you are from uh, Indonesia, uh, some are from the uh, uh, Philippines or Thailand or uh, around uh, Malaysia, around the region. So you can go back and tell everyone that you've met the, uh, the smartest uh, woman in the United Kingdom. Uh, so. Uh, I, I mean, it's great. So she looks like someone who has it all, yeah. Uh, as it's sort of clear, and so uh, I think it's just, just for uh, women in the UK, women everywhere, and just a great role model for every one of us. So, uh, so Dr. Shah. Thank you. Okay, so um, this evening um, I'm going to uh, talk about the scientific basis of climate change and I'd like to thank the people here um, very much for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, what I want, most of what um, the results that I'm going to show you this evening come from the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that came out last year. And uh, this report um, is really an incredibly impressive report in the sense of the amount of scientific effort that goes into um, writing it. So um, there's more than 600 authors from 40 different countries were involved in writing the main report itself, but there were many hundreds of more expert um, reviewers that looked at the details of the text. And so what it ends up being really is a very consensus document of the scientific understanding. And there have been four of these reports so far. This was the, the fourth one in 2007. And uh, work is underway to produce the next report, the fifth one, um, which is anticipated to come out around 2013. Um, and uh, so almost all the figures that I'm going to show today come from this, um, come from this report. But where there's been updates to the science since that report, then I'll mention a few of those updates as well. So I thought I'd start off by uh, telling you some of the work that my colleagues do. I work at the British Antarctic Survey um, in the United Kingdom, and uh, many of my colleagues spend large amounts of time in Antarctica. And uh, this is an example of some of my colleagues out in the field. We have. Um, a couple of these small planes that uh, can take scientists out and they literally um, live in these tents on the ice for months on end. Um, and these are scientists who are interested in looking at ice cores. And uh, so there's two different types of ice cores that, uh, that we take. Some are um, hand drilled ice cores and this is an example of, of the drill and you can drill down um, a few meters or so with these hand drilled ice cores to take ice samples at different different parts of Antarctica, but there's um, a very large international effort um, to drill much deeper than that, to look much further back in time um, at the history of the ice cores. And this is um, an international station called Dome C, um, where ice core samples have been taken, where we've drilled down now more than three kilometers um, into the earth. 
And uh, that gives you a sample of the air in the atmosphere going back 700,000 years or more. And I'll show you some data coming from those isopods in a minute. And this is the, the actual machinery that's used to drill those, those ice cores. And if we look here, this is what then the ice core sample looks like. So those ice cores, once they've been drilled down, they're drilled in sections at a time. And then they're actually shipped back to Cambridge and stored in Cambridge. And then thin slices of the ice cores are taken. And this next picture shows you what one of those thin slices from the ice core looks like. And we'll let these people come in. I think these are the lost students. <laughs> so what you can see in this, in this uh, section of the ice core are there are really hundreds and thousands of small little bubbles of air. And these little bubbles of air are bubbles of air that were trapped in the ice when the snow originally fell. And so as you drill down to depth, then you drill through a that fell at different times in the past. So as you go down to three, three uh, kilometers depth, then you're reaching air that fell 700,000 years ago. And so what you can do is then melt these ice cores, you get out the air, samples of the air, and by analyzing the gases in the air, you can determine what um, the atmospheric conditions were like at times in the past. So this is some of that data. And uh, so this is data, this is the present here, and then this is going back in time. This is in thousands of years, so this goes back 700,000 um, years ago. And just to give you some idea of the time scale on this, then um, over this time period, well, it's a little bit uncertain exactly when um, humans evolved, but Neanderthal man was still on the Earth all the way up to here about 30,000 years ago. Humans probably evolved around about this sort of time as well, modern humans, around about maybe 130,000 years ago. So that's how far back in time we're able to go with these ice cores to look at the um, climate conditions of the past. Um, another date to, to tell you is that um, humans evolved agriculture about um, 5,000 years ago. So agriculture was introduced really to the tail end of this, of this figure. So what you can see very clearly from this ice core, if we look at this data, this is the carbon dioxide in those little air bubbles, is that historically, carbon dioxide levels have been between roughly 180 and 300 parts per million in the historical part. And if we look at current day values, they're considerably higher than that, around about 390 pots per million. Okay, next thing to look at, we can look at isotopes of oxygen in these air fossils. And the reason that it's interesting to look at isotopes of oxygen is by, because by looking at the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, you can determine what the temperature has been in the past. And this is largely due to the fact that um, the amount of Oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 in water depends on um, the, depends on the temperature. And so the amount in the uh, um, in the atmosphere depends on the temperature. And what you can see quite clearly, if you go back in, in the past, is that um, where the temperature has been high in the past, carbon dioxide levels have been high. There's, there's good correspondence between these um, two pictures. So what's causing these, uh, these variations in both the temperature and the carbon dioxide? Well, um, what's these, these periods of lower temperature are, are the ice ages, and uh, the gray shaded areas in between are the uh, warmer interglacial periods. And these differences in temperature arise from variations of the orbit of the Earth around the sun, the so-called Milankovitch um, cycle. And uh, the, the end of the last um, ice age was about 21,000 years ago, and we're currently in an interglacial warm period. So just one further graph um, to show you that comes from these um, ice core measurements. 
is the graph for methane. And you can see that uh, over this historical time period, there's also been small changes, particularly associated with the interglacial warm periods and the amount of methane. Um, and then if you look at the present, there's been a very significant rise in the amount of um, methane, considerably above the historical values um, in the last century. Okay, just two pictures I wanted to show here, again, to give some indication of historical changes. Um, the top picture here is a picture of the Thames River um, in London, and it shows ice being carved out of the Thames. And between the 14th and the 19th um, century, 24 winters, the Thames froze over, hasn't frozen over since then. Um, and uh, this was in a period which is often known as the, the Little Ice Age. And indeed, they used to have midwinter fairs on the ice. And you can see it was really very thick ice. I mean, this looks like it's several meters um, thick at times. And um, it's, uh, there's still debate as to exactly um, why we have this, had this period of colder temperatures, um, particularly in northern Europe. Um, but there's some indication it may be um, as a result of solar changes, which I'll come on to discuss later. So that's um, the River Thames in London, and this is a cave in France, and what you're looking at are pictures of horses that were um, painted by cavemen living in this cave. Um, and uh, what you can also see is that there's water in this cave. And in fact, this cave is currently about 100 meters below water, the entrance to it. You can only, you can only reach it by diving um, through the entrance. And these paintings were done um, just um, at the uh, end of the last ice age, when sea level was about 100 meters different to uh, its current levels. So you can see that um, both in terms of sea level and in terms of temperatures, there's been significant variations in the past. But both these variations um, are due to, if you like, natural causes, and what I'm going to come on to discuss is more recent variations that have perhaps not got such natural um, causes. So what can science tell us about climate change? Um, I've already given you some indication that uh, observations from ice cores can give us a record of past climates, but there are also other sources that can tell us about um, past climates information coming from tree rings, um, information um, coming from corals. The corals end up giving you a record very much like tree rings in terms of their growth. They put down a new layer of growth each year and you can determine aspects about um, the climate and particularly the ocean conditions from the corals. Um, in addition, we've got more recent measurements coming either from ground-based um, instruments um, these are weather balloons taking, taking measurements, and very, most recently from satellite data. So there's a broad range of different data that gives us information on the past um, climate. So using all those different sets of data, then you can try to reconstruct what the temperatures have been over the last um, thousand years. This is now not just taking into account, as I, we heard before, was just the information coming from ice falls in Antarctica. This is information coming from um, more widespread across the globe. And uh, what you can see from this data is that broadly, um, over the last thousand years or so, um, the temperature compared to um, the first half of this century has been varied between about just over one degree below what it was during the first half of this century to maybe, uh, maybe a quarter of a degree or so above. And it's varied considerably throughout that time period. And if you look here, we're starting to move outside the range in which it's varied over that last thousand years or so. Now, looking at this data, um, it's important to realize that the amount of information we have going into this graph varies over time. So if you look at relatively recent past, all these dots show where the data has come from, whether it be tree rings or um, 
uh, of coral samples in the ocean or, or other indicators of what the temperature has been. You can see that here in 1750 there's quite widespread information, but if you go further back to um, year 1000, then there's much less data and it's um, much less global in its coverage. So you have to be slightly careful about interpreting the values in the, particularly in the first half of this um, time period. Okay, if we want to start to try to understand what some of the variations that we saw, if we just go back to this picture, you can see there's quite considerable variations over the time period in, um, these, uh, in, the, in these temperatures. This is global average temperature that we're looking at. Um, if we want to try to understand what some of those variations may have arisen from, one thing that we know has a very significant impact on climate um, are certain volcanoes. If the um, ash from the volcanoes manages to get into the atmospheric circulation, then it can significantly alter the climate for a number of years following a volcanic eruption. Um, this is um, the last very major volcanic eruption that has a um, significant impact on global climate in 1991, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. But there have been other major eruptions in the past. Um, this is the famous Edward Munch painting, which was painted in 1893. And uh, many people think that the reason that you see this very bright red sky in this painting was as a result of the earlier, um, 10 years previous eruption of Krakatoa, which generated very um, a large, large amount of dust into the atmosphere and for um, a number of years afterwards there would seem to be very um, red sunsets. Um, another famous eruption was in 1815, the eruption of uh, Tambora, uh, which was followed by what's commonly termed the year without a summer in 18, uh, 1816 and was accompanied by many deaths throughout the world. Um, there was heavy snow in June in New England, um, and, and, and frost and river ice in July and August um, as far south as uh, Pennsylvania in the States. But then also throughout Europe and Asia, there were various uh, food shortages and riots. And so if we go back to look at uh, these temperature changes over the last thousand years, we can come up with an estimate, um, again, from some of these uh, proxy data of what the volcano, volcanic eruptions may have been in the past. This is the Tambora eruption in 1815 that I just showed you an indication of. And uh, in addition, we can also come up, and this is rather uncertain and subject to, to revision at the moment, but we can also try to come up with um, an idea of how much uh, the solar variations have been over this time period because the sun um, doesn't always output the same amount of radiation that varies over, over time. So if we first of all look at the volcanoes, you can see that what these times where there have been volcanic eruptions, they typically align with cooler temperatures in the temperature record. So here and here, for example. Similarly, if you look at this solar output, then there's some indication that there may have been um, more solar output during this period here um, and when it was perhaps what's known as medieval warm period and perhaps um, weaker solar activity during this period here which is often known as the Little Ice Age. But as I said, particularly the solar um, record is something that's very uncertain. Okay, let's move a little bit closer to the, to the present. And um, as we move closer to the present, we get where it would be much more precise in terms of what the um, records show because there are more and more um, records. And this is showing on the top here, this is global average temperature for the period 1850 um, to the present. And here we have global average sea level over the same period. And you can see that very systematically, um, over this time period, particularly in the second half of the time period, there's been a significant increase in both global average temperature and global average sea level. So that's from pre-industrial times, so from before 1850 to the present time, if you take temperature, for example, we've seen a rise of about three quarters of a degree.
degree centigrade over that time period. One important thing to realize is that that figure that I just showed here shows the global average, but in fact, the same temperature rise has not occurred equally everywhere. And so if we look at this top plot with the temperature, this is showing the period just when we have satellite data since 1979. And you can see that some places have warmed very considerably more than other places. And indeed, just in this 25-year period, there are some um, places that have warmed by more than half a degree centigrade, which is a very considerable amount. You'll also notice that the land has warmed considerably more than the ocean, as is expected from um, theoretical grounds. If we look at the sea level, you might think that sea level ought to um, really be flat everywhere, but um, that's not the case. And instead, there are also very strong regional variations in the amount of sea level rise. Again, this is um, for the period in which we have satellite um, data. So this becomes an important point to realize when considering future predictions. Now, although we often talk about the global average, some locations will warm very significantly more than other locations. Some locations will have significantly more sea level rise than other locations. <coughs> so I just thought I'd now mention just a couple of other signs of um, changes in the climate over the last century or so. Um, this is one that gets uh, a lot of interest, is the changing glaciers, just because you can see visibly um, the difference. And this is a picture of a glacier in Alaska. This is what the glacier looked like in 1941 from a photograph. This is a photograph taken from essentially the same place in 2004, and you can see the glaciers retreated right back um, to the top of this picture. This is a glacier in Austria. Um, this picture is from 1875, and you can see the glacier was um, filling this whole region. This is a picture from the same spot in 2004, and you can see there's essentially no sign of the glacier any longer. And if you, it's not true that all the glaciers of the world are retreating, but many of the glaciers of the world are retreating. And if you look at the global glacier mass balance, then you can see a very significant decline um, over um, the recent decades. Another area that's had a considerable amount of press interest recently has been Arctic sea ice. And this figure shows the September Arctic sea ice extent. This is when the Arctic sea ice is at its minimum um, levels. And what you can see is that there's been a very strong decrease. This is from 1978 to the present day. There's been a very significant decrease in that September um, sea ice extent, with the absolute minimum being in 2007. This, this last year, 2008, was also very small. And you can see up in this figure here, this line here shows what the average um, for the 1979 to 2000 period was in terms of the sea ice extent. And in white, you're seeing what the 2007 sea ice extent looked like. And then just very recently, you might have heard in the news um, about the Wilkins Ice Shelf in Antarctica. This is on the western side of the Antarctic Peninsula, and it's currently in the process of disintegrating. And we have quite strong um, uh, evidence to suggest that this disintegration is as a consequence of warming associated with climate change. Then I've just got a couple of other examples which I wanted to highlight. Um, there's evidence of um, significantly less, particularly cold nights, um, throughout the world, and evidence of more, particularly warm nights, throughout the world. And this has both good and bad effects. So this is, you know, potentially for crops, this may be a good effect of climate change. If you have less cold nights and more warm nights, you can have a longer growing season. But at the same time, it's also good for pests. And so in Europe, for example, there's a very um, clear correlation between the decrease in number of cold nights and the increase in the spread of a disease that affects sheep called 
blue tongue um, virus. And then finally, um, relating to some of the things that Kerry Emanuel has been talking about, um, there's some indication that at least um, the number of the strongest storms um, has been increasing over recent time. Okay, so that's some of the observational evidence of changes in the climate over the last hundred years or so. What I want to say a little bit about now is um, what determines the Earth's climate and what might have been generating those changes over the last hundred years. And um, so I guess everyone knows that what determines the Earth's climate is essentially the greenhouse um, effect. Um, on one level, the greenhouse effect is a good thing. The Earth would be considerably cooler if we didn't have um, the greenhouse effect, and essentially, um, as I'm sure you're aware, we have energy that comes from the sun, and it's either um, directly reflected back to um, space, or um, it's trapped uh, by the atmospheric greenhouse um, gases. And uh, the, this, this basic effect has been known for almost 200 years um, now, and uh, at the end of um, the, uh, at the end of the 1800s, just at the turn of the century, then um, a Swedish scientist, Arrhenius, um, had suggested that if we increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then that would lead to an enhanced greenhouse effect. So the basic understanding of the science of the greenhouse effect has been known for a long time, although obviously the details of the effect are continuing to be better understood. So this plot here shows um, a record just for um, the last uh, thousand years of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So this is the tail end of the original ice pool record that I, that I showed you. And what you can see is that the levels were around about 280 parts per million for most of this thousand years and then they shot up very significantly more recently and we can look at the date which they shot up and the date is remarkably close to 1769 when they started to increase and you think well what happened in 1769 and uh, well in 1769 then James Watt uh, invented the more efficient steam engine um, and this is no coincidence and uh, so these are two pictures. This is this is Manchester in England in 1840, and you can see all this uh, industrial production. And then this is a picture from China in 2008 that is remarkably similar. So most of this um, increase in carbon dioxide levels has occurred since the industrial um, revolution. And an important um, contributor to this rise has not just been the industrialization, but also the increase in population that's occurred over that time period. So in 1800, the world population was about a billion. Um, in 1900, it was um, about one point, just over 1.5 billion, and now getting up to 6.7 or so billion. And by 2050, the um, population is anticipated to reach 9 billion people. So just the increase in number of people on the Earth um, over that time period has had a significant um, impact uh, on the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, so what sets the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? What sets the levels? Well, the first part of the carbon cycle um, involves exchanges between the land and the atmosphere. And more people coming in. Those exchanges uh, there's a huge amount of carbon that's exchanged between the land and the atmosphere each year, and if you add them all up, they amount to about 120 gigatons of carbon um, per year, and that comes from things like um, weathering and respiration um, and uh, interactions with the, with the vegetation. Then the second um, large exchange that happens is between the ocean and the atmosphere, and in this case, um, we have about 90 gigatons of carbon that exchange back and forth between the ocean and the atmosphere each year. So these are really huge numbers in terms of the exchange um, between the 
land, ocean system and the atmosphere each year. Now on top of that, we have been putting about six to eight um, gigatons per year of carbon into the atmosphere, um, through mainly through fossil fuel burning and land use changes. Those are the two most important contributors. The atmosphere, uh, sorry, the, the, the Earth system has actually um, acted to take up about half of that, so that the increase in the carbon in the atmosphere is only about half this level. And that's an important point to note, that the sinks of um, carbon on the land and in the ocean are able to take up an extra um, three to four gigatons of carbon per year that we're outputting. So if it wasn't for the land and the ocean, then the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would be much greater than it is. So where are these um, carbon emissions coming from? Well, um, the most important source is from energy. That accounts for just over a quarter of the uh, carbon emissions. Transport is also an important um, contributor. And deforestation is another very significant contributor, accounting for almost 20% of the emissions. And in terms, this is a graph just showing um, how these emissions have been changing over the last um, few decades. And what you can see is that although there have been increases in all sectors, things like industry, road transport, deforestation, etc., the biggest increase is in electricity. So when people talk, um, it's not just carbon dioxide that's a greenhouse gas. There are other important greenhouse gases as well. We saw in the ice cores I showed you um, methane, which has increased very significantly, which in terms of its um, potential to generate global warming is um, about something like 25 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. And then nitrous oxides, for example, are also very important greenhouse gases can be about 300 times more powerful in terms of their effect. And so in order to come up with one number that incorporates all of those greenhouse gases, people talk in terms of um, carbon dioxide equivalent, the amount of carbon dioxide equivalent. So that takes into account the methane and the nitrous oxide and the other greenhouse gases as well. And so in the year 2000, the total greenhouse gas emissions globally were about 34 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And the number for last year was already up to about 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And that 50 gigatons, you can divide it up, you can work out which countries are to blame. Um, so for last year, about 30 gigatons came from the developing world and about 20 gigatons from the developed world. Um, this is the figures individual countries for the year um, 2000. And uh, well, not surprisingly, you can see that the United States, uh, Australia, and Canada are up here with very large values. The one that's almost off the screen here is uh, the uh, United Arab Emirates. You might not be surprised by that. Um, I thought I'd put on here Singapore, since this is um, where we are. Um, and so Singapore comes in at about 13 um, uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year per person. Is that a high number? It's sort of around about the European average. Okay. China, well, China, yeah. So this, this graph shows the amount per person. So per person, China is quite low. It's around about five gigatons. But there are a lot of people, so. So actually China has just um, overtaken the United States in terms of the total emissions, but the emissions per person is still very much less than it is in the United States. Okay, so that's some of the, um, uh, some of the observations and, the, and, the, and the, in terms of the, how the climate's changing and what might be generating those changes. Um, what I want to come on to now and say a little bit about 
what science can tell us about climate change, and in particular what models can tell us about um, climate change. And um, so this is actually so the, the, the students who are on the, on the screen school who are doing my project will recognize this picture. This comes from um, uh, a version of the Hadley Center um, model, which is run as part of the climateprediction.net um, program. And so the students have got it running on their laptops. Um, this is one thing that the models can tell us. Um, the models can help answer the question of why it's not the warming that we've seen to date be due to changes in the sun or due to volcanoes. So I've already showed you that both the changes in the sun and volcanoes have had an impact on climate in the past. Might those not be um, generating the changes that we've seen over the last 100 years? And so what, you can test this out in a, in a model. And this is shown here. This is um, in black are shown the observations of temperature over the last 100 years. And then overlaid on top of that are um, the temperatures that um, models predict over the last 100 years. And what is shown here are the results of 14 different climate models. And there are a number of runs of each of those climate models. So in total, there are 50, 58 different um, model simulations that are shown here. And the solid red line is just the average of all of those. And what you can see is that the models are able to track very well the temperature variations that you see over the last 100 years. And these models have included in them the um, changes that we know have happened over that time period in terms of the sun, in terms of volcanic um, output. And you can see the volcanoes have been marked here. And they also include increases in greenhouse gases over this time period. What you can do in a model context is then take out the changes in greenhouse gases and see what would happen if those greenhouse gases hadn't been increasing, whether or not we'd have still got that same temperature increase. And so this is what you get if you do exactly that. So this graph here on the right-hand side is exactly the same model runs as on the left-hand side, but in this case, there was no greenhouse gas increases. And what you can see is that temperatures tracked quite well, the observed temperatures for the first half of the last century, while in the second half there was considerable deviation. So unless you take account of the increases in greenhouse gases, you don't get the observed rise in temperature. This is showing for the global average, but you can also look at each individual um, continent and you see a similar pattern on each individual continent. So the next thing to ask is, well, so if, we're, if it seems that um, we might be predicting increases in temperature in the future, um, what would we say is, is dangerous climate change? What do we want to, to avoid in terms of increases in climate change? And this is a, obviously a very difficult and subjective question to answer, but people have tried to look at different categories and try to um, analyze what sort of temperature increases we would really like to avoid in different categories. So they looked at, for example, food, water, ecosystems, extreme weather events, and the risk of abrupt and major irreversible changes. And as a result of looking at um, each of these categories, then a number that's often taken, and is taken in fact by the European Union as a number that one would want to avoid in terms of future um, temperature rise, is about two degrees centigrade relative to pre-industrial times. Now, it's important to remember that we're already on three quarters of a degree centigrade, so we only have one and a quarter degree centigrade to go before we reach that point. Okay, so with that in mind, um, let's look at some of the predictions for the next few decades that come out of the climate models. And um, this is showing, it shows what the temperatures were for the last um, century, um, and what you're seeing is the same plots as you saw just a minute ago, where you saw the black is the observations, the red is the models run with carbon dioxide, uh, with greenhouse gas increases, and in blue it's without. And then, in terms of the predictions into the future, you see what the predictions are with um, greenhouse gas increases and 
in yellow and without in green. And these are um, the projections under the A1B scenario, which is, as Kerry Emanuel mentioned this morning, a sort of mid-range um, emissions scenario. And, uh, well, if I put on that two degrees centigrade line, then you can see that in almost every continent, um, there's a very significant chance of reaching well into that two degrees centigrade barrier um, by 2050. If we go out further in time and look at uh, the rest of the century, this is now just looking at the global average in terms of um, surface warming, and I put again the two degrees centigrade line on there, and this is looking at three different scenarios. There's the A1B scenario, that mid-range scenario in green, and then there's a high emission scenario, A2, and a low emission scenario, B1, shown in red and blue. And uh, you can see that uh, under the highest scenario indicated here, the A2 scenario, by the end of the century, you're getting up to temperature increases of um, four or more degrees centigrade um, above pre-industrial values. And the last time that uh, we saw temperatures on Earth of that sort of temperature, was in the Eocene period. Um, and in the Eocene period, there was, uh, the world was essentially swampy everywhere. And uh, you, you could find alligators at the North Pole. It was a very, very different Earth um, to the present day. So I just wanted to put this picture up here to remind you that although um, these plots are all showing the global average, there are very significant regional variations terms of temperature increases. On the left hand side here um, are the temperature increases um, for 20, the decade 2020 to 2029, um, which have started to become remarkably close. And you can see that in many parts of the world, we're getting temperature increases of a degree or more. Um, if you look at the end of the century, the last decade of the century, see that you get very significant temperature rises. This is under the A1B scenario, again, that mid-range scenario. And you can see that these um, continental land areas are seeing easily temperature increases of uh, four or five degrees centigrade. And up here in the Arctic region, you're seeing um, temperature increases of seven or more degrees centigrade. Just to mention some of the other predictions, um, some of the predictions associated with the sea. Um, sea level is very difficult to predict um, what the sea level rise might be over the next century. Um, if you don't take into account um, possible ice sheet collapse, then you're looking at perhaps um, sea level rise of something like 10 to 60 centimeters, depending on which emission scenario you follow. Um, but these predictions are very uncertain and in particular, there's great uncertainty about what might happen to the ice sheets in the Western Antarctic and Greenland, both of which could contribute um, individually five meters or more of sea level rise. 10 to, 10 to 60 centimeters doesn't sound very significant, but for some low-lying um, countries and islands, then even um, tens of centimeters of sea level rise um, might cause significant um, difficulties. And there's a very real risk of um, climate change induced refugees having to, to move from their, from their countries um, as a result of sea level rise. If, um, you know, some, as a result of some of this uncertainty, the, the sea level rise is more like a meter or so, then huge areas, particularly actually in Asia, huge areas of um, coastal communities be significantly affected. So sea level rise is very uncertain. We're trying very hard to better understand um, ice sheet dynamics to try to improve our predictions of that. But it has a possibility to have very great impact. Um, sea ice is another thing that we've got very great uncertainty about in terms of the modeling. Um, but some of the more recent models indicate that the Arctic might be ice-free as soon as 2050. And 
you saw in the observations that I showed, there's been a very significant decrease in the amount of um, ice, sea ice in the Arctic um, over the last couple of years. Um, these are just two other plots that I wanted um, to put up. One show, the top one here shows um, precipitation intensity, so this is um, rain and snowfall, and the bottom one shows um, the number of um, dry days. So this is looking more at extreme events, and what you can see is that there are large regions of particularly the northern um, mid-latitudes which are likely to see a very significant increase in the amount of heavy rain cold events. And then there are very large regions, particularly um, southern Europe and uh, um, uh, in, in, in Africa and, and indeed in the United States, that uh, likely to see significantly increased risk of um, drought. I thought since we're um, in this part of the world, I put up uh, just one plot of the regional projections at the end of the century. Now, these projections, when you start really getting down to the regional scale, uh, tend to be much more uncertain when looking at the global picture. And it's something that a lot of work has been done at the present to try and improve these regional projections. Um, what you're seeing at the top here is the projections for the Asian region for temperature increases and bottom is for precipitation increases. Um, and on the left-hand side, you're seeing December, January, <coughs> February, and on the right-hand side, June, July, August. And the basic message is that in Northern Hemisphere winter, um, you're likely to see very significant um, temperature increases, particularly in the, the, the more northerly parts of um, Asia. And um, indeed, these temperature increases considerably exceed the global average. And then, in terms of precipitation, you can see that there's also a significant increased chance of precipitation um, in much of, um, again, the more northerly part of this region, but then also um, in, in, other, in other parts of the region as well. January, February, June, July, August. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to um, bring this round um, to um, start to think, these are some, I've shown you some of the projections that we have to bring you back um, to thinking about not just the numbers, but what this means in terms of um, uh, uh, dangers to different parts of the earth system and the earth in which we live in, and um, if you remember I showed you this figure and suggested that 2 degrees centigrade is often taken to be a number um, which we want to avoid increasing the temperature above, um, because you know, if you look for example, let's take one example here, ecosystems, um, as you, e even just a few degrees um, centigrade increase has a significant chance of damaging coral reefs. But as you move above 2 degrees centigrade, then the habitats, the species that are temperature sensitive, either in terms of their latitude or in terms of their altitude, um, uh, result in a very significantly rising number of species facing extinction from temperature changes. So as I say, 2 degrees is the number that's often taken to be a temperature that we want to avoid. Well, what does that mean in terms of what we should be doing um, to try to avoid um, reaching that state. Well, these are some numbers that um, have come from the Hadley Center's um, climate model, but other climate models um, show rather similar um, numbers. This is looking at um, the likelihood of exceeding certain temperatures. So two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, five degrees, six degrees, seven degrees. And this shows on this axis, uh, uh, here shows the um, um, stabilization level of um, carbon dioxide equivalent. So this is the um, ultimate amount of carbon dioxide equivalent that you would have in the atmosphere. What um, temp what's the likelihood of exceeding certain temperatures? 
So I should say at the moment, the carbon dioxide equivalent in parts per million that we have in the atmosphere is 430. Okay, so we're getting very close to this value, we're at 450 already, currently on 430. And you can see that, you know, according to these predictions, at 450 parts per million, there's a 78% likelihood of eventually exceeding 2 degrees centigrade. If we look at the highest value that's on this plot here, which is 750 parts per million, which is a sort of mid-range, um, if we put in no policy at all, what we'll end up um, having as our um, atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide equivalent, then we start to get to the, a very real risk of getting into these very high values. 5 degrees centigrade increase, 47% chance of exceeding that. And if you remember, I said that the last time we've seen 5 degrees centigrade on Earth was in the Eocene period, um, where the Earth was a very, very different place. I would mention that we're already on 430 parts per million, so it's probably unrealistic to um, expect that we might stabilize at 450 parts per million, although you can see from these numbers that it would be highly desirable if we did. If we take um, instead 500 parts per million, then you can see that we're almost certainly not going to be able to avoid that 2 degree centigrade increase. But we might be able to avoid some of these high values. So the reason that I mention all that is because you're probably aware that this year um, is the uh, very important climate conference in Copenhagen in December when exactly these sorts of targets are going to be um, discussed and negotiated. And uh, there have been four things that, are, that have been um, set out by the um, chief UN um, negotiator on this of what's going to be discussed at this conference, and they're the following. So the first one is how much are the industrialized countries willing to reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases? And you know, looking at the science, then ideally you would say that you would want to stabilize at 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent, but maybe more realistic is, um, for political purposes is 500. Um, the second question is, how much are the major developing countries um, willing to do to limit the growth of their emissions? And um, this is very important in the, in, in the sense that, uh, as I mentioned, for 2008, um, the values, the total global emissions of carbon dioxide was about 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent, um, of which about 30 gigatons was produced by the developing world. And this number is significantly increasing. And if um, that amount increased at the current rates, then by 2050, um, then a very the, the amount of emissions from just from the developing world um, would be more than 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide um, equivalent. So um, this, this is something that does need to be addressed in the future. But at the same time, how um, is the help needed by developing countries in, to engage in reducing their emissions and, and this is important, to adapt to the inevitable impacts of climate change going to be financed? And um, finally, how is that uh, money going to be managed? And I think one thing that you will um, undoubtedly hear about associated with these is that one of the easiest wins, if you like, one of the easiest ways of significantly decreasing um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions is to tackle deforestation. And um, there's, a, there's um, a significant effort at the moment to try to do something about um, reducing deforestation. For a rather small amount of money, economists believe about $15 billion, you could halve the amount of deforestation. And as I indicated earlier, deforestation accounts for almost 20% of um, uh, carbon emissions, so it's a very significant percentage. So this is something that you're going to hear a lot about in the news over the next six months, and that's going on. Please ask questions.
for those effects um, is, uh, is very useful. And in terms of um, if the temperature change that you're seeing is as a result of changes in the radiation balance of the Earth system, essentially, because you've increased um, the amount of greenhouse gases, then you would expect that to be a global effect. You wouldn't expect it to be a regional effect. The sun comes uh, into the Earth from, from, from all directions. So what you're looking for is something that has a global effect rather than a regional effect, and that's why um, we end up looking at global averages more often. I think his question would be more, how do you define different global average temperature? Yeah. Oh, I see. In terms of area average, area weighted, you mean? Yeah, it's just area weighted average, yeah. Sorry. Surface area temperature. I, 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 I read about uh, global heating. Yes. All right, and uh, global heating is actually due to pollution. Yes. The, the gas exhaust aerosols, right? And global heating has been helping us because the, this pollution reflects sunlight, and so we are not getting the real effect of, uh, of uh, global warming. Um. So, so question is, uh, how much of global heating um, so it's certainly true that um, the global dimming as a result of aerosol is not so much actually as a result of aircraft, but just other aerosols from soot, for example, in the atmosphere um, has had an influence of um, reducing the temperature increase that we would have seen over the last um, century had it not been for those soot. And that, and that soot is now actually reducing significantly um, in the atmosphere as a result of various um, environmental legislation that's, that's resulted in it um, decreasing. I don't know the exact numbers for um, how much, maybe somebody here does, for how much the temperature is predicted to have been reduced by over the last hundred years, but it is by a small amount. So I think we would, we would likely, likely have seen slightly higher temperature increases. So because, because we reduce pollution. We reduce pollution. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, there is a fair amount of uncertainty, but it's about one quarter. One quarter. One quarter. Oh, one quarter. The case is on about one quarter. Oh, all oh, one quarter. But we took this a long time. Mm. Yeah, sorry. Could you show me uh, the last slide? The very last slide. The very, very last slide. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Just very draw a comment on that. Yep. Because as you mentioned, this is a political process to be <coughs> finalized. So this is not a final version. No, no. And uh, yeah, just to point out to make that clear. And in particular, the item number three, the two items mentioned, that is reducing of the emissions and adapting to the impacts. And in particular, in that field, there's a lot of discussion going on. Gave three quite different time scales. I mean, one is like spanning uh, thousands or, or millions of years, and then one maybe in the last thousand, mm -hmm. thousand years, and then the third perhaps in the last and projecting in the last hundred years. Yep. So what I found very striking actually was was the first was the beginning when right? there seemed to be these spikes. Uh, over there, I mean, is, is that kind of a, you know, if, if you go back to the right at the beginning, I mean, yeah, they were, they were, These they are the ice ages. Right, 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 but, but there, there's just this very striking spikes at the end of, of everything. Oh, yeah. Right. So is this, uh, is this a uh, reasonably convincing evidence of something going wrong with, you know, yeah. with, with the earth? I mean, is this, but these are these are the very sharp spikes you see are the increases in the, in the in the greenhouse gases and 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 actually I mean I didn't I didn't explain but 
for example, by looking at the different isotopes of um, carbon in the, in the carbon dioxide, you can determine whether or not the increase in carbon dioxide has been through fossil fuel burning or not. Um, and so by looking at that, then it, it's very clear that this increase has largely been as a result of uh, increased fossil fuel burning. And uh, the methane increase largely is as a result of land use changes, agriculture, um, landfill sites, um, for example. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these, I've just shown two of the gases, but you can look at other greenhouse gases and you see very similar, very similar. Yeah, it's very interesting. Look at temperature. It's not, it's even lower in some of the temperatures. It is, um, and that's important. Thousands of years ago, right? It, and that's important because um, these previous temperature increases have been associated with ice ages, where the amount of ice on the planet is very different. And when you change the amount of ice on the planet, then you change how much sunlight the, the Earth manages to reflect. So if your temperature changes are essentially as a result of that, then you can have a very different relationship between the temperature and the carbon dioxide. Whereas at the present time, you see these temperatures aren't nearly as high as they have been at some interglacial period. Um, uh, and, and yet the, the, the greenhouse gases are much, much higher. And that reflects the fact that there's a different amount of ice on the Earth than there has been at the previous time. Or not either. But presumably that uh, albedo effect you didn't mention, but it's taken account of in the model of the various climate models and predictions. Um, yeah, it is to the extent that it can be, and it can be. I mean, no, but yeah. I mean, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are very significant uncertainties in the models, and you know, one area of modeling that's that I mentioned is very uncertain is sea ice. And part of, you know, part of the difficulty in sea ice is that it has clearly an albedo effect and that's difficult to model. So um, there, is, there is uncertainty associated with that as well. Sorry, global cooling in the future. Um, as a result, of, uh, how do you anticipate us getting global cooling? Moving into the next ice age. So I mean, we, you know, we are, you know, in, in the absence of climate change, we are heading in towards the next ice age, um, and that should be happening in around about 30,000 years of the next ice age. But there's actually a very real chance. I mean, looking at the models, there's a very real chance that we might you not know, stable the, the next ice age um, if we do enough uh, greenhouse warming. But otherwise, you, know, you are on the background of all this. It are these long, long time scales that are determined by the orbital changes of the Earth around the Sun. Um, but <coughs> what we're doing on top of that is significantly changing what the natural change variations would have been anyway, and on a much, much um, tighter time scale. So these temperature increases that you see here in the past associated with moving in and out of ice ages have happened over a time period. So they look very sharp on here, but that's just because there's so many years. They have, have happened over a time period of about 5,000 years, um, whereas what you're seeing in terms of recent temperature is very more significantly sharper increase in temperature over a shorter period of time. I, mean, I should just put in a caveat to that, which is that um, if you look at Greenland ice cores, there is some evidence at the end of ice ages where you have very, very sharp temperature increases. This might just be a regional effect because it's just in the Greenland ice cores, but you can find um, temperature increases of 10 degrees centigrade within 10 years. Um, and those very dramatic effects are not captured by any models suggesting that there's some aspect of the climate system that's not properly incorporated um, in climate models at, at the present time, probably associated with um, ice dynamics. So there are, there are uncertainties. I don't want to suggest that there aren't. There are very real uncertainties in the models. But um, nevertheless, the, taking all the evidence together, I think that the very great scientific consensus is that uh, we're significantly changing the climate and we're likely to do so in the future as well.
So uh, I think you are, some of you may not be aware of this, but uh, so Emily just arrived uh, yesterday. So uh, she's done a really great job for someone who has uh, presumably suffered, who's presumably suffering from jet lag. Uh, so that was a very interesting, although I, I find it somewhat bleak and uh, <laughs> dire talk. And uh, uh, so uh, I would like uh, to thank Emily and uh, please join me. Uh, thank you. Of our appreciation, we have a little um, souvenir for you.